Welcome to Hamburgers and Horror, the home of meat, monsters, and melting masks. I'm Noah Hook, and today we're looking at Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. The third Halloween abandons the Michael Myers plotline, opting for a fresh new story. We follow Dr. Dan Chalice, who teams up with a young woman named Ellie after he witnesses her father be gruesomely murdered. Their investigation uncovers a ridiculous plot involving androids, Stonehenge, and the mass murder of millions of children, all orchestrated by a small town mask maker. When John Carpenter and Deborah Hill were approached by Erwin Yablons and Mustafa Akkad about another sequel, they accepted on one condition, no Michael Myers. Despite popular demand, they were tired of Mike and wanted to try out new ideas, especially considering Carpenter always wanted Halloween to be an anthology series. Producers reluctantly agreed, and Tommy Lee Wallace, who was the art director and production designer for the first two Halloweens, hopped in the director's chair. This was his directorial debut, but he'd go on to direct Fright Night 2, Vampires Los Muertos, and the IT miniseries. Upon Carpenter's request, science fiction writer Nigel Neal was brought in to write the screenplay, but disagreements between Wallace and Neal ultimately led to him leaving the project with Wallace penning the final version of the script. Halloween 3 pretty much ditches the slasher genre, opting more for witchcraft and science fiction. It also shifts away from more typical gore and gives us more… well you'll see. Special effects artist Don Post was brought in to make the film's iconic masks. For those who don't know, Don Post created some of the first latex masks ever and has been dubbed the Godfather of Halloween. Carpenter and Alan Howarth once again composed music for the film, this time working entirely with synthesizers. And you know our king Dean Cundey returned as cinematographer. Like the earlier Halloweens, the cast was mostly comprised of character actors. The leading role was filled by Carpenter regular Tom Atkins, who you may recognize from The Fog, Night of the Creeps, or the My Bloody Valentine remake. The role of Ellie is played by Stacey Nelkin from Hunter, Yellowbeard, and Bullets Over Broadway. Our over-the-top villain Connell Cochran was played by Dan O'Hurley from Robinson Crusoe, The Last Starfighter, and Twin Peaks. Nancy Keys and Dick Warlock return, both portraying new characters. Season of the Witch was released to theaters and was met with widely negative reviews. My favorite description I could find of it was anti-children, anti-capitalism, anti-television, and anti-Irish. The biggest detractor for most people of the time was the lack of Michael Myers. Some viewed it more favorably as it is overflowing with ideas, but most agree it is a bit of a mess. Halloween 3 grossed 14 million at the box office, which is still good considering its $2 million budget, but it was the worst performing Halloween so far. It's gone on to have re-releases and home video outings, and currently has a 41 and 27% on Rotten Tomatoes, making it one of those rare films that is rated lower for audiences than critics. It isn't as universally hated as it was upon release, and there are those who love the film. It might be the most divisive film in the whole franchise, and I'm excited to revisit it and share my thoughts. Don't change the channel, because we're watching Halloween 3. The movie opens with a sick-ass title card and a hint of the fun new score, as the opening credits eventually unveil a new digital jack-o'-lantern. It's October 23rd in North Cali as a man named Harry is desperately fleeing from an unknown driver. After failing to get inside a body shop, he successfully hides from his pursuers. Just kidding, they're back. Harry backs into this silent, Adam Scott-looking thug who starts strangling him. Harry manages to pull a car loose which very slowly crushes the assassin. He is spotted by the driver and Harry runs for a full hour until he reaches this rainy gas station. Attendant Walter watches a news story about how a humongous stone from fucking Stonehenge has been stolen, and we get our first taste of the Silver Shamrock jingle. According to Halloween, 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 according to Halloween, Silver Shamrock. Which is counting down to Halloween and talks about its three super cool masks you should totally buy. Walter investigates a noise, but it's just scared ass Harry, who says they are coming and passes out. Walter unknowingly saves himself by taking Harry to a hospital, and it's time to meet our protagonist. Dr. Dan Chalice arrives at his ex-wife's house and presents his children with some Halloween masks. Sorry Dan, them kids already got the silver shamrock masks. Take your Dollar Tree crap and get out. Oh shit, it's the jingle again. 
The drunk doctor gets called to the hospital, and of course it's to help Harry. He starts rambling that they're all going to be killed, which is enough for Sweet Walter to peace out. They give Harry some sweet sleepy drugs, and Dan and Nurse Agnes are too busy playing grab ass to notice another grey suit has entered the premises. As Dan naps, the assassin gloves up and eliminates Harry by jamming his fingers into his eyes, hell yeah. The killer wipes up his mess and strolls away, and Agnes's screams lead to Dan following him outside. But the assassin hops in his car and takes a gasoline bath, kaboom! Save him Dr. Dan, ah, he dead. This minor explosion means Dan can't pick the kids up, but he agrees to take them next Saturday. We jump to the morning and Harry's daughter has arrived to confirm it's him. She's obviously shocked to hear some random guy killed her dad and set himself on fire. Oh, now it's Wednesday I guess, and Dan is trying to learn anything he can from forensic assistant Teddy, who says the guy actually broke Harry's skull in multiple pieces. What the fuck are y'all doing now? So now it's Friday, and drunk ass Dan is tired of the Silver Shamrock ad interrupting his Halloween marathon. He's greeted by Ellie, who was told he could be found at this bar pretty often by the nurses, and she thanks him for attending her dad's funeral. He shares what happened that night, honestly saying he has no idea what truly happened. Ellie takes Dan to her father's store, which was losing a lot of money to the new mall. He always kept detailed records, and she's figured out he no-showed all of his appointments after he went to pick up some silver shamrock masks. She's not leaving town until she finds out the truth, and who better to help than a horny, alcoholic doctor? Dan says, fuck my parental responsibility, I'm going to play detective with this lady who's half my age. They drive to the small town of Santa Mira, where a rich Irishman named Connell Cochran opened a huge toy factory, which has turned primarily to mask making. The town is very Irish, and the locals are very observant, as are their surveillance cameras. Posing as husband and wife, they rent a room at a motel, and Dan notices Harry was there a few days before his murder. Connell Cochran drives by, and the motel owner praises the supposed genius. An RV strolls in, and Dan meets Buddy Kupfer, his wife Betty, and their shitty son Little Buddy. An angry woman named Marge rolls up, who is picking up a shipment of masks from Silver Shamrock. Dan offers to sleep in the car or on the floor, but apparently these two have some sort of raw, natural, sexual attraction towards each other, so we have to deal with their ridiculous romance throughout the movie. Jamie Lee Curtis voices the 6pm curfew as the Santa Mira locals hide away for the night. Apparently Dan and the liquor store couldn't care less about the curfew, and he is accosted by a thirsty homeless man. The man tells Dan that Cochran has destroyed Santa Mira, bringing in outsiders to work in his factory, and denying any locals from working there. He mentions some crazy rumors he's heard, and warns Dan to be careful, as he is definitely being watched by Cochran. And he was right when he said they were being watched, as the man is surrounded by two of Cochran's cronies, one played by Dick Warlock, who proceed to rip the poor guy's head clean off. Back at the motel, Ellie gets chatting with Marge, who complains about the company's quality and timeliness diminishing now that they are doing big business. Dan is on the phone with Teddy, who says the autopsy they've been performing must be from part of the car, as all they found is plastic and metal, not organic material. Then Dan and Ellie have some sexy time, a couple of times I guess. Marge starts fiddling with the silver shamrock logo that fell off her son's mask, and she notices a little switchboard on it. Some bobby pin prodding causes a blue beam to blast out, which fucking destroys Marge's face. Wow, look at that. And a bug crawls out of her head for extra points. Dan and Ellie watches some real official looking doctors take Marge away, and they meet Mr. Connell Cochran in the flesh, who says Marge will be treated at the factory's emergency facility. It's Halloween Eve now, and Teddy still can't find evidence there was ever a body in the car. Dan also has her look into Cochran, unaware they're being listened to. Dan and Ellie finally head to the factory, and they confirm that her dad picked up his order. The Cupfers arrive, and Mr. Cups has been the best mask salesman, and is being rewarded with a tour of the factory with Cochran himself. Buddy asks if his new friends can join the tour, and Cochran happily obliges. We get to see some cool mask-making stuff, some weird novelty stuff, and little Buddy demands a mask. 
Those haven't been through final processing, but this one sure has. Cochran says the final processing is just quality assurance, but he will not let them peek into the ominous door. Dan notices some familiar looking suits and decides it's time to hidey ho. Ellie sees her father's car, but it is blocked by a bunch of scary boys. Ellie is creeped out and wants to leave, and packs up while Dan tries to contact the police. Too bad those pesky phones aren't working. Dan returns to find Ellie missing and five thugs waiting outside for him. They start breaking in and Dan crawls through a back window as cars start pursuing him. He plays hide and seek with them all the way back to the factory and finds a way inside. He lurks around the empty factory where he runs into an old woman knitting? But that ain't your average everyday grandma, that's a mechanical grandma. Dan gets snatched, slung, and strangled by an assassin, but the doctor manages to get the upper hand and punch right through his torso. The guy starts spitting up egg yolk, which, along with some wires in his tummy, reveals he is actually an android. Dan is cornered by more androids as well as Cochran, who has upset Dan broke his old lady antique. He knows Dr. Dan's real identity, and thinks he'll be fascinated with what he has in store. It's finally Halloween, and Cochran says the robotic insides of the androids were easy to make, but their latex exteriors took much longer to perfect. They enter a huge underground lab, where lo and behold, they are keeping that fucking rock from Stonehenge. He says the stone has some sort of devastating power they plan to harness, and shows him Ellie is alive but restrained somewhere in the factory. He wants to show Dan a demonstration, and enter the Cupfers. Told they are to give opinions on a new commercial, they are herded into a locked room. The Silver Shamrock ad that will play tonight begins, and it requests that little buddy put on his mask to watch. A jack-o'-lantern starts strobing, and the switchboard on the mask activates, which quickly fries Little Buddy. And it releases a whole bunch of bugs and snakes, which apparently kill the Cupfer parents, I guess. We watch as children around the country dress up in their silver shamrock masks, and an ad reminds kids to tune in at 9pm for some sort of giveaway, which is when their broadcast will blow all their heads up. I know it's been asked a million times, but how does that work with different time zones? Teddy is still a character in this movie, I guess, but not for long. A sneaky android grabs a drill and eliminates the pesky scientist off-screen. It's 7.30 now, and Dan is tied up and ready to get his head melted. He asks Cochran why he wants to massacre a bunch of kids, and basically it's because people these days don't respect Halloween. He talks about the barrier between the living and the dead disappearing, and how the last great festival of Samhain was 3,000 years ago. The hills ran red with the blood of children, and it is time for another festival, as the planets have apparently aligned correctly. Cochran masks Dan up and leaves him to watch Halloween, but he and his android stop paying attention as he tries to escape. Well that was really easy. Mask throw, 100% accuracy. Oh look at that Mr. Android, it's almost like a Michael Myers POV! Cocky is too busy talking business for the android to tell him their hostage is escaping, as Dan goes full John McClane with 49 minutes until the child melting. They catch on to his escape, but not before Dan gets onto the roof. He sneaks past more androids and tries to warn Linda about the masks. His story sounds about negative 30% believable, and she hangs up. You better stop that broadcast. He finds where Ellie is located, which means Cochran has located him. He sends the Robo Squad after them, but Dan and Ellie use some real stealthy moves to sneak right past them. Dan locates a bunch of those deadly switchboards and somehow manages to stroll up to a big switchboard and starts the commercial before being spotted. He makes it rain tokens on the androids who all get zip zapped to shit. This makes Stonehenge angry, and it and the ring of TVs light up. Cochran gives Dan a clap before he is blasted, turned to stone, literally disappears, and the stone just blows the fuck up. Dan and Ellie run from the flaming factory and drive from the flaming town. Dan hasn't realized Ellie hasn't said a word since he rescued her, and the android attacks his face. They hit a tree, and despite losing an arm, Robo Ellie strikes again. Dan grabs a crowbar and knocks her head off, but he is assaulted by the severed arm in the car, and one last time by the headless android before it finally shuts down. Dan runs away into the woods, apparently pretty close to home, as he ends up at Walter's gas station. Dan gets on the phone with whoever has the power to take commercials off the air, and tells them millions of kids will die if they don't. Despite sounding like a madman, the ad starts getting taken down but it's still on the third channel, 
Dan begs for them to take it down as the jack-o'-lantern begins to flash. The movie ends on a disturbing note as we flash between the broadcast and Dan begging them to stop it. Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! And that's Halloween 3. Oh boy, this is an interesting one. Most fans of the Halloween franchise feel pretty strongly about Halloween 3, and I feel like I might disappoint both groups because I feel pretty mixed about it. There is a lot of good and a lot of bad, and for me it evens out to a pretty decent experience. Let me start with some of the good stuff. The premise is so ridiculous, and I can't think of many movies outside of like Troma and Full Moon that are so unironically absurd. The practical effects look way better than I expected and really push the franchise to a new limit. The cinematography still has that great Halloween look, thank you Dean Cundy. The music is fantastic, and I really respect the guts it took for them to start with a new idea three movies into the franchise. But this is also where I start to have issues with the film. While I respect the decision, trying to turn Halloween into an anthology series into the third movie was just a stupid idea. I'm fine with the discontinuation of Michael, but they should have just given this movie a different name and started the anthology from here. But semantics are not my biggest issue with Halloween 3, and I'll actually be retreading a few of the things I said I liked. While the story is ambitious, the movie itself just feels like a jumbled mess with no cohesive theme by the end, the last 15 minutes are just chaos, and while it's entertaining, it leaves me with so many unanswered questions, and not in the good way. Why did Cochran want to kill all these kids? I took it that the sacrifice was necessary to provide a good harvest or something like that, but for who? For the farmers of this town? I don't know, maybe Cochran grows cucumbers on the side. The androids are also so far out in left field, I don't know how they tie into anything at all. Don't get me wrong, I enjoy watching them rip people's heads off, but why are they robots? <laughs> And why do Dan and Ellie have this stupid relationship? Girl, you are looking for the people responsible for your father's gruesome murder. Stop getting fondled by this old guy who you barely know. Speaking of, why does Dr. Dan ditch all of his parental and job responsibility to just go on a weird vacation to help this girl he doesn't know solve a murder that has absolutely nothing to do with him? And what the fuck is going on with Stonehenge, and why did it vaporize Cochrane? <laughs> if you have an actual answer for that one, please explain it to me. The bugs and snakes are pretty lame. I'm never grossed out or scared by bugs, so they just feel unnecessary to me. And that speaks to a larger issue with the film for me. It's just not scary. There's not a single moment where I'm at the edge of my seat or feeling tense. And that would be okay if the movie was a lot of fun, which parts of it are, but some parts just drag. Wasting time with Teddy, weird sex stuff, or boring factory tours. I do love the ending, and I actually think it's one of the best of all time. It just takes a while to get to. At the end of the day, I think of Halloween 3 as a dumb, fun movie. If you turn your brain off a bit and don't think about character motivations or plot holes and just enjoy it for the ride that it is, you should be able to have a lot of fun with it. It has some fantastic visuals, good acting, and a story you won't soon forget. While I don't love Season of the Witch, I do remember liking it better than a lot of the lackluster Michael Myers sequels we get later on, but don't hold me to that, that's what we're rewatching them for. Part of me will always wonder what would have happened if they kept up with the anthology idea, but alas, it was not meant to be. That's why next week I'll be covering Halloween 4, The Return of Michael Myers. Thank you all for joining me, and an extra thank you to my patrons. As always, I'm Noah Hook, and this has been Hamburgers and Horror. Stay safe out there. Thanks for watching my review of Halloween 3. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and subscribe so you can keep up with my weekly horror reviews. And if you want to help support the channel further, be sure to check out my Patreon account. You'll be able to vote for future movies and franchises I cover on the channel. Thanks, y'all.